Today's presentation is Mills and the Conor de Gwinnett. It is my pleasure to welcome Rachel Zook, our CCHS Museum Curator, David Smith, he is our Can't Michelle Guide and a wonderful volunteer and also board member, <coughs> and Sue Meehan, a wonderful CCHS volunteer. Please give them a big warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Let me uh, add my welcome as well. And on behalf of the eight of us, or actually nine of us, who served on the Mill Committee uh, over the past five years, uh, I noticed that many of you were here last week, and I apologize to you because you're going to have to hear some of this introductory stuff for the, uh, over again. Um, but I felt I needed to, to share it uh, with the new folks. Five years ago, a group of staff and volunteers from the Cumberland County Historical Society met to plan a project to develop a book on the water-powered mills of Cumberland County. Richard Tritt has led the group over the years, which in the beginning for two years included Charlie Bender and Bob Rowland, and then continuing for all five years, Rachel Zook, Rob Schwartz, Sue Meehan, Dan Drawball, Sandy Mater, and myself. Mary Lou Shaman joined us during the last two years of the project. We divided the task into logical, geographical, and topical areas and began work. Today is an introduction to that work, which culminates in the publication of a 364-page book next month. This is the lead map for that book. Every dot you see is a mill that we located. Uh, we know there are many that we did not locate, just based on some of the, the research that we did. But these are the mills that we'll be looking at today. This is the group that we looked at last week. In May, as Linda said, there will be mill-related tours and the museum exhibit opening the end of next month. Hopefully, hopefully to coincide with the book arriving here, it is at the printers as we speak. Today's talk will focus on just an introduction to some of what we have learned in 364 pages. We can't summarize that in an hour uh, this afternoon. You wouldn't want us to. <laughs> Conor de Gwinnett Creek is one of the major drainage systems in Cumberland County, the other being the Yellow Breaches Creek. The Conor de Gwinnett flows through the north side of the valley and the Yellow Breaches through the south side, both flowing west to east with the confluence at the Susquehanna River. The Conan de Gwinnett rises on the slopes of North or Blue Mountain in Franklin County and flows for several miles before entering Cumberland County. After entering Cumberland County, its flow is enlarged by Middle Spring Creek, which actually rises on the slopes of South Mountain in Southampton Township. From where Middle Spring Creek joins the Conan de Gwinnett at the Franklin County border, it flows for 69.6 .6 miles through the county. Big Spring Creek, Latort Spring Run, Silver Spring Run are some of the major feeder streams uh, that add to the flow of the Conda de Gwinnett. When settlers arrived in Cumberland County in the 18th century, they were faced with creating a home in a true wilderness. They had to clear land, erect homes, and other structures and begin life in a land often faced in the beginning with hostile indigenous populations. Many of those settlers brought with them the knowledge and ability to use water power to lighten their load and provide for an improved standard of living. Most of us tend to think of grist mills when we think about a water powered mill. However, water power was used for many purposes beyond that of grinding grain into flour or meal. A grist mill is defined, defined as one where farmers bring grain or corn for grinding to make flour or meal. The earliest of these was established, according to some sources, at Lieber's Mill in Shippensburg. A merchant mill does the same kind of work, but the miller acquires the grain or corn and then sells it on the open market. Many of these mills did both types of work. The mill shown here is the Anks Mill in Dickinson Township. 
<coughs> chop mills did similar types of work, but converted the grain into uh, products for animal consumption. There were many sawmills in the county. Many of them were in existence for only a brief time, and we did not focus on them in this book, though we do have an explanation of how they worked. <coughs> Some of the more elaborate sawmills made shingles, and a spoken fellow meal, we <laughs> mill, made wheels. Some of the more elaborate sawmills also made products such as doors, windows, and shutters. <coughs> A fooling mill prepared wool for manufacture of a variety of woolen goods. A woolen factory and a carding machine were often part of the industrial operation at a fooling mill. The mill shown here is the Horner Mill in South Middleton Township. A hemp mill did similar types of work with flax fibers to form a rough cloth for clothing and sacking or for making rope. Oil mills made linseed oil from flaxseed. This is the Grissinger Oil Mill in North Middleton Township. An early type of mill around the time of the American Revolution made gunpowder, a very dangerous operation, and frequently resulted in explosions killing the miller. The two mills in the, in the area around Shippensburg that I researched, in both of those cases, the miller was killed during an explosion. A plaster mill made lime from limestone, which was then either to fertilize fields or to make mortar and plaster for construction. Paper mills, like this one in Mount Holly Springs, produced a variety of types of paper, including newsprint, writing paper, and cardboard. Uh, one of the mills that I'll be talking about in a few minutes made the, those egg crate type cardboard to hold eggs on. They made them on a very large scale. They were three feet by three feet for the odorless egg company in Shippensburg. <laughs> clover seed mills hauled clover seed to prepare it to be used for planting. Bark and sumac mills were part of the leather industry. An iron ore blast furnace, though normally thought of as a mill, actually used water power to make the furnace function by driving the bellows, which forced air into the furnace, making it hot enough to melt the ore. And the related industry, the forge, used the water power to drive the hammers, which converted the pig iron into a product that could then be manufactured into a variety of other products. Southampton Township, as I mentioned earlier, is the source of Middle Spring Creek, but it's also the source of the Yellow Breaches and of Mountain Creek. So it's a very uh, important source of, of the headwaters of many of the creeks that, that flow through the county. Moving on to Middle Spring Creek itself, that watershed is the, actually the name of the stream that flows north, or, yeah, flows north from South Mountain to the continent of Gwinnett, but the name doesn't become applied to it until it leaves Shippensburg. Prior to that, there are a variety of streams that uh, feed from South Mountain, including Bird's Run, Main's Run, Means Run, Gum Run, Milesburn Run, and Quarterman's Run. So quite a few streams are flowing out of the mountain to form uh, what will eventually become Middle Spring Creek. Except for Bird's Run, all of those others that I mentioned combine to form a stream called the Branch which flows through Shippensburg. It does not become Middle Spring Creek until Bird Run runs into it uh, north of the town. I found a paper written in 1909 at the Shippensburg Historical Society written by John Orr. And according to him, at least at that time, he had record of or knowledge of 25 mills on Middle Spring Creek, including eight grist mills, five saw mills, two oil mills, two chopping mills, one axe factory, one carding mill, one clover mill, and one distillery, all in that short stream. We did not find all of those in the research that we did, but the evidence of what I did find is what I'll be sharing with you next. <coughs> one of the things that was amazing to me is these streams often, as they flow out of the mountain, are, are narrow enough you could leap across them if you were a good leaper. Uh, 
but yet they were used for, for uh, driving mills uh, before it re reached the larger streams uh, downstream. This one was located on Miles Burn Run, actually two different furnaces, and the location of the Augusta furnace is the pile of stones that you see here. It's all that remains of it. According to the, the record, Yu Long was the owner of this land in 1824, but he may not have built the furnaces. The subsequent owner was John Moore, and it is reported that his daughters were uh, the ones for whom the furnaces were named. A variety of subsequent owners occurred during the 19th century, eventually being acquired by the Philadelphia Reading Coal and Iron Company. And the, as I said, the surviving feature is this pile of stones. We did not find the location of Mary Ann Furnace. The uh, Iron Master's Mansion still stands along Baltimore Road. It's called the White House even today uh, by the people who live there. Another furnace in the area was the Cleversburg Iron Furnace, and apparently at some time was also called the Isabella Furnace, but its location was not able to be determined. Cleversburg is located on a couple of those feeder streams that we mentioned earlier, and the grist mill was located here, originally built by William Leeper around 1814, eventually acquired by George Clever, and it was while he had it, and he was, as you can see, living here at that time. Um, while he had it, this, the village grew up and took on his family name. The Clever family owned the mill in this area from 1829 to 1870. This is a part of a 1909 Sanborn map, or actually the first page of that book of maps, uh, that shows the Shippensburg area. And one of the things I liked about it is it really clearly shows all of these streams flowing out of South Mountain. So these are the ones that combine to form the branch and then eventually Middle Spring Creek. This is Bird's Run here, and, and where just off the map it combines with Middle Spring Creek. A close-up of the map shows the two main mill locations in Shippensburg all on the branch. Uh, as long and as prominent as Bird's Run, and I, we found no evidence other than sawmills of mills being located on Bird's Run. But the, the two locations are here south of town and the other here north of town. This is a drawing done by William Burkhardt, a well-known Shippensburg historian did a series of these drawings to illustrate the mills on the south side of town. This one is uh, illustrating Leaper's Mill, the <coughs> oldest one we found a record of, and possibly the oldest mill in the county, dating to 1738. <coughs> it was not a very well-run mill in that it didn't have advanced equipment, but at least no longer did farmers have to go clear to the su across the Susquehanna. There were no other mills in Cumberland County at the time. <coughs> So you could get a very rough meal or flour using the, uh, the Leaper's Mill at Shippensburg. Around 1811, it was converted to a cotton mill and then eventually went out of business. Just north of that, the site, the Leaper Mill would have been down here, was the site of a mill called the Cobweb Mills, apparently named because there were lots of cobwebs in it. <laughs> The earliest owner we could locate it for was Benjamin Reynolds in 1817, then Samuel Angle in 1831. It eventually uh, becomes purchased by George Dykeman, and some of you familiar with the Shippensburg area know about Dykeman's Pond and the fish hatchery located down in this area. The, uh, the mill was burned on January 4th, 1889. It's interesting, as, as Mary Lou shared with you last week, these fires are, are uh, a major feature, unfortunately, of mill history. And it's often where we get our best information about the mill, because there's a detailed write-up in the newspaper article of the fire. The next mill in this area, just in that same area, shown as here as the Rumble Hines Company, but it actually started as the Metcalf Engine Works. It was not a mill in the traditional sense of a mill, but like the iron blast furnaces, it used water power to run its machinery. 
It was owned by J.L. Metcalf from 1889 to 1895, and later became the Shippensburg Manufacturing Company. The, the shift then was to clothing rather than to uh, engines and that type of machinery. And in 1903, as this map shows, it's the Rummel Himes Company. And you can see that the dam would have been here, the intake of water here with the water wheel, and then flowing back into the branch at this end of the mill. The uh, Metcalf Engine Works made steam engines, boilers, and a variety of other related projects. Before moving on to the mills on the north side of town, this water wheel was a significant feature in Shippensburg in the early 20th century. And it was used to lift water from the branch into the H.C. Angle tannery that was located roughly behind where the public library is today in Shippensburg. Next mill area is that north of town. This was known by many, many different names over the years. We're calling it the T.P. Blair Mill, but uh, it was also known as McLean's Mill, it was known as Funk's Mill, it was known as Town Mills or as Town Roller Mills, uh, depending on its history. The earliest record we could find for it was 1783, being developed by John Reynolds. Remained in the family until 1814, and then was acquired by T.P. Blair. Then we're not quite certain, did, did William McLean own it, or did he uh, simply run the mill there? But it became known as McLean's <coughs> Mill from 1852 to 1881. However, during the Civil War, T.P. Blair apparently still had some interest in the mill because he filed a Civil War claims application, one of the largest we found for losses in, in, 19, in 1883 when the Confederates invaded the Cumberland Valley. W.C. Burkholder had it from 1915 to 1918, and then the Funks had it from there until its demise in 1949. And this postcard shows it identified as Funk's Ducks, or Funk's Ducks on Funk's Duck Pond, the, the mill pond. When it was called Town Mills in, in this 1910 map of Shippensburg, uh, it was run by Edgar, Edgar R. Funk. And though it's a little hard to read this, uh, probably for, from where most of you are sitting, the uh, Insurance map, because it is an insurance map, listed all of the uh, machinery that was in the mill. He also ran a hosiery mill here, so half the mill was a grist mill and the other half was making hosiery. And another uh, of the maps showing, this one from uh, 1910, showing the location of the mills on the north side of town. As you leave Shippensburg and you finally acquire <laughs> Middle Spring Creek, the first mill we come to is known as Zierfoss's mill. Zierfoss never owned it. Uh, he was a miller there, and for some reason, historically, his name, just as Enk's mill back on the Yellow Breaches, uh, is identified with the miller, not the owner. But we identified it going back to 1824, being built by Andrew Fraser. Had a series of owners uh, and operators, including Isaac Zierfoss. Uh, he apparently ran it when Henry Stewart owned it. Uh, Willis Burkholder had it for a while, and then John Riggs. It closed around 1935. It was used at bo as both a grist and or a fulling mill uh, during the course of its history. The next mill, just north of town, is the James Caldwell Mill, or the, the Caldwell Mill, which was built on land owned by James Caldwell, who acquired that in 1788. His son, John, actually built the mill in 1798 and ran it until 1831. Our particular interest in this mill is the last Caldwell owner, James Smith Caldwell, who inherited it when he was 18 years old. Caldwell, some of you who are from Carlisle will recognize that name, as a lawyer who practiced here in Carlisle before the Civil War, and in his 40s elected to join the Union Army uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the war in 1861, and he was killed at the Battle of Antietam in 1862. The, the book Bitter Fruits is based on the letters between he and his wife. The mill was eventually acquired by the Book family and was last run by the Hauser family in 1891. 
Uh, it had to be, the mill had to be taken down to straighten the road uh, in 1960. There were several additional mills that we found record of, uh, the Cleefs, Kleins, Thistles, uh, but could find very little information about them. So the next area we come to is the village of Middle Spring. It had a large, this uh, map that was made for the newspaper in 1958 shows the location of several of the mills. Uh, and this included the Chambers Mill and the Kramer Mill. Chambers Mill is particularly important because of the Chambers family. Uh, we're all familiar with Chambersburg. The youngest brother of the owner of this mill was Benjamin, and he is uh, the person for whom Chambersburg is named. Th this is uh, where James's mill was located. Uh, you'll also later hear about Robert, who had a mill on the Big Spring, and others in the Carlisle area. Uh, there is a small section of the book on the Chambers family, just to kind of pull all of that Chambers family history together. We found very little about the Kramer Mill. We know it was built by Peter Kramer in 182, and we believe it was located literally next door to the Chambers Mill. The final major mill that I'm going to mention is the Schrock Paper Company. One of the reasons we have no evidence left of the Chambers and Kramer's mills is because this was built on top of those sites. So they pretty much uh, obliterated the sites of those earlier grist mills. The Schrock Company and Paper Mill was built by two brothers, Edward Schrock and his brother Samuel. Uh, they acquired the land in 1866. Uh, in some of the history, it's known as the Middle Spring <coughs> Paper Mills rather than the Schrock Mill. Later in its, in its existence, it used both steam and water power. And it's the one that made those interesting uh, odorless egg cardboard uh, structures I was talking about earlier. The mill was destroyed by fire on July 4th, 1898, which included the loss of the mill in five company houses. So this was apparently a fairly large industrial activity. It was not rebuilt, but the dam was used for a time to run the Middle Spring Light and Power Company. Two additional mills on the creek were the McCune's Mill and the Martz Mill. Both were grist mills. <coughs> Martz's Mill has come to be known as the Burnt Mill uh, for obvious reason. Most of what we know about the Martz Mill, which dates back to 1763, is from the 1888 November fire, which totally destroyed the mill. It's apparently quite a large structure. Flames from the, the fire could be seen from Shippensburg. I am now going to lead you uh, to Sue Meehan, who will take you down the first section of the uh, left. Hello. Now we are going to leave the town of Shippensburg and move out into a more rural portion of the county which was my uh, great pleasure to learn about. Uh, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about it too, those of you who aren't familiar with it. This picture of a field in West Hensboro Township reminds us that agriculture was the building block for settlement of the county. And mills were essential in, that, in the success of the development. In the background, you can see double gap, just to orient yourself. This picture depicts a crop that results from modern farming practices. In the early days of settlement in the county, when the majority of the mills were established, most individuals had smaller fields of wheat, barley, oats, or corn, grown mainly for the owner's consumption and for his livestock. That livestock was most likely the family milk cow, <coughs> some sheep, and probably some pigs, as well as chickens. And most self-sustaining farms also had some fruit trees. The pigs supplied hides for leather, as well as meat, and they were easy to feed with scraps. Sheep helped clear the fields and also provided meat, as well as wool and hides. These components provided food, milk, and wool for family, and perhaps some whiskey, too but a mill was required 
to turn the raw materials into usable forms. Getting to the mill was of major importance. Roads were not improved. And the ideal arrangement, as David mentioned before, that they had to go to Harrisburg, the ideal was to have a mill within a half a day's ride so that the farmer could make the round trip in one working day. For the millers, it was a case of build it and they will come. And build they did. This picture is taken in Hopewell Township. At the left in the background, you can see Ramps Covered Bridge. This is the last covered bridge in the county, which is still standing in its original location. The covered bridge was a large improvement over the early Ford crossings, which many horses didn't like to take. Most of the bridges were constructed in close proximity to a mill and their names are taken from the mills. In the foreground of the picture, you can see traces of the walls and the dam of Ramps Mill. And you can see how close this was. The Conna de Gwinnett runs this way. This, again, is the foundation of Ramps Mill. It now serves as the foundation for a beautiful garden created by the current owners of the mill. The mill is located just south of Route 641 in Newton Township, and it was built by David Sterrett in the 1780s. This is a map of Springfield to Newville along the Big Spring. Here's Springfield, and here's the Big Spring coming into Newville. This is five or six miles in length. I'm not sure of the exact length. During the Civil War, Springfield <coughs> consisted of 50 dwellings, and the population was about 200 people. This is an 1858 map, and it shows the location of six mills just in this six miles, from the head of the spring to the confluence with the Conna de Gwinnett. And by the way, all of these maps will be in the book so that uh, you can study them closely when the time comes. McCracken's Mill. This mill was built in 1784 and was the first mill in Springfield. It stood at the head of Big Spring. The Big Spring mills were unusual in that the water came directly from the creek into the mill without long mill races. Uh, it, it feeds in right down here. Uh, this is a little modern. Uh, there was a large like sawmill here at an earlier point in time. When this mill was owned by a man named Manning, who owned it from 1862 to 1873, the mill sold flour that was ground from a superior type of wheat that was grown in the county, which was called full caster wheat. The flour was transported uh, in Grand Cumberland County style. Transportation was important. It was transported to Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York City where it was discovered by buyers for Queen Victoria. So Cumberland County flour was used in the kitchens of the Queen, who made special orders for the flour. The mill was demolished in 1960, and the stones were used to reinforce the banks of uh, the Big Spring Creek, which of course is now a wonderful site for fishing. This mill was built by James Piper in 1770, and was in an operation for many years. Uh, after 1900, however, the mill did not produce flour, but ground uh, cornmeal, wheat, and a new grain that was becoming very popular in Pennsylvania, buckwheat. I think uh, this area of Pennsylvania became famous for buckwheat. The mill burnt down in 1823, but it was rebuilt and uh, was in service for a good many years. This is downstream of Piper's downstream of Neely Road. This mill was built in 1785 and was in operation for 150 years. After 1850, the mill also housed a carding machine and it processed plaster. It closed in 1940. Now, Ur Irvin's mill was known for its high quality cornmeal and just as today's shoppers go to Wegmans, 
people would make a special trip to buy the Irwin's Mill corn meal. Can anybody tell me what this one is? Yell it out. <coughs> Nobody? Yes, if you said if you said Lachlan's Mill, you're correct. <laughs> this is iconic for Newville. It was built around 1763. It was the first mill erected on Big Spring, and it's the last one standing. The Lachlan's owned and operated the mill until 1894, and the mill used millstones, uh, only millstones, until it closed. It never converted to the more modern uh, rollers. Here's a, a more identifiable picture. The Newville Water Authority took possession of the mill in 1954, and a water wheel was added to the side for visual effect. <laughs> Wasn't, wasn't any use anymore, but... Uh. <coughs> Ginter's Mill. This mill was built in 1791, and it outproduced all the other mills along the Big Spring. It was also known as Glendale. It was located where, just behind where Sailor's Grocery Store now stands in Newville, you turn to go back along Mill Road, and it's fairly near the confluence of the Big Spring with the Pana de Gwinnett. The White House is still standing. The mill was remodeled in 1906 and modernized at a cost of $3,000, which would be nearly $78,000 in today's money. Uh, just an example of how maintaining, upgrading, and even rebuilding after the fires or accidents created a continuous investment process for mill owners. They, they were financiers of the sort. This 1858 map section traces the Conda de Gwinnett from the edge of Hopewell Township to just west of Newville. Here's the Hopewell town line, and here's Newville, where the Big Spring enters the Conda de Gwinnett. Along the whole Conna de Gwinnett, from the edge of Franklin County to the river, uh, we've been able to document, document 58 major water-powered mills just in the Conna de Gwinnett. But again, as David pointed out, one hour isn't enough time to do the justice. But the book has the stories for each one of the individual mills. This picture shows the abandoned mill race that served Pfeiffer's Mill. Pfeiffer's Mill. The mill would have been about here in the foreground out of the picture. And the mill race continued on down there and out to the Con of the Gwinnett, which is, you can barely see there, which is parallel. The mill was also known as the Lower Thaler Mill or the Mount Vernon Mill. We use the name associated with the bridge that crosses the creek where the mill stood. The grist mill was built between 1830 and 1835, probably by Christopher All. In addition to the mill, All had what might have been the largest still in the county, and it was powered by the water, the water mill, the water wheel at the mill. He kept a large number of hogs and they were quite happy hogs because they were fed generously with the mash from the still. <laughs> this is a picture of the Conda de Gwinnett taken from uh, Pfeiffer's Bridge. This would have been the uh, mill race over here. The mill would have been here. We're on the bridge and you can see uh, traces remaining of the dam along the which has been removed. Just north of that, uh, crossing the Conda de Gwinnett there, uh, stood the house of David Sterrett, the brick house, uh, and he had a mill along the Three Square Hollow Creek, which came down this way and came down and joined the Conda de Gwinnett, which would have been over here a little bit but the, the mill was just beside the house. <clears throat> he built the mill in 1762, and it was in the family for three generations. 
He also built this large brick mansion, and it stood until the 1980s when it was destroyed by fire. But it was, uh, I think, one of the largest brick buildings in Cumberland County, certainly in rural Cumberland County. <coughs> this sportsman's club off Steelstown Road in Newton Township is located in what is, by tradition, the second oldest <coughs> mill in Cumberland County, but we were unable to verify that claim. Records show it was operated in 1768 by James Chambers, who uh, David just spoke about. <coughs> This was a grist and sawmill operation on the Conna de Gwinnett. The Conna de Gwinnett runs back this way. The mill race came in here, cut across a finger of land where the green spring comes into the Conna de Gwinnett over here, and the mill race was cut to come across here almost, almost a quarter of a mile, not, not that long, but the, these mill races were incredibly long. It came into the mill and then exited out to the Conda de Gwinnett on this side. The mill was three stories high and had four runs of stone. And it also had a large still here for many of the early years. John Eckert ran the mill from 1837 to 1870. And the mill and the bridge, and the bridge is uh, back here in the near distance. Um, that bridge in the mill took his name. The Big Spring Fish and Game Association have held the property since 1950. This picture shows the Ginter Mill in McRae, Newton Township, on the road that goes up to Dublin Gap. It has been in operation since 1779, when it was built by Samuel McCormick, who was a member of the McCormick family who were quite a presence in the eastern part of the county. This little area here is a small store that the Ginters had uh, where they not only had uh, some goods for sale but it also served as the post office for McCray and it operated until 1955 when uh, uh, rural free delivery uh, came in. It was quite the gathering place uh, for the locals, as many of the mills were. Here's a picture of George A. Ginter, who's the third generation miller. He took over from his father and his grandfather. And we had another picture of that. Uh, Ginter, I'll just go back to tell you that Ginter's Mill is one of two mills remaining in the county that do any uh, milling at all. It uses an electric uh, hammer mill to chop grain and they combine grain for animal food. The other is uh, Sunday's Mill. <coughs> Schooler's Mill was built in 1762 by a Scots immigrant. This is the first mill to be erected in Mifflin Township. Schooler's family had been millers for generations in Scotland, and they came with the ability to serve as both millwright, the person who builds the mill, and miller, the one who runs it. This mill was nearly 150 years in the family. Uh, at, in the later years, the sawmill was a very important function, and the farmers would bring their wood in the winter, as we're aware now so much uh, tree cutting is done, the, the wood was cut in the winter, the logs were brought uh, to the mill, and when the water was flowing again in the spring, the sawmill began to operate in earnest. The wooden wheel in the mill was replaced by a steel wheel, steel wheel in the 1850s. This was the common uh, modernization practice. And there's now a historical marker at this site placed by the family association of one of the early German mill hands mill hands. You can see that as you go along the road. This is a 2012 version of the mill that was once such a vital part of the community. The Dublin Gap Creek flows from left to right and joins the Conagwinnet. Um, <coughs> well, uh, back in here. That's where the, the creek is.
This is a drawing for Wing's history of what was known as Pleasant View. This group of buildings still stands along Creek Road in West Pensboro Township. We are calling this Shella Barger's Mill because he owned it the longest and he was part of the community uh, that supported this, but it was built by David Snyder, a member and a clergyman of the United Brethren community who moved to this area from Lancaster County at the end of the 18th century. And the, the CCHS library has a wonderful booklet uh, called Pleasant View, which gives a great history of this uh, community and this <coughs> mill. This is the same complex viewed from across the river in about 1900. In the early 20th century, the mill uh, was converted to elect, uh, provide electricity and it provided power for the Newville Mount Holly trolley. It was later owned by PP&L who removed the top story when they converted the mill. The house is still standing and the mill building has been adapted for living space, but uh, this upper portion is no longer in existence. And this, uh, it just looks very different from the road now. So it's very <coughs> close to the road and it has a stone uh, exterior on, on the street side. Here's another 1858 view of the Conoquinet as it flows from Newville <coughs> between Frankfurt and West Pensboro. So there's <coughs> Frankfurt and comes on up here. The large northerly loop, or finger, provided the ideal location for a mill that served both townships. Graham's Woods Road now runs through this finger of land. Recalling the slide of the field that we looked at first, um, the soil to the south of the Tacona de Gwinnett is a very rich limestone soil. But the soil in the northern part has a shale base and it's not nearly as productive. So that's why the big uh, productive fields are seen in the south of the continent of Gwinnett. This is an aerial view of that same tip of that finger that goes up there. Alter's Mill stood right here and emptied it. And the mill race began over here. You can still see it and walk it comes the whole way across there so you can see how significant that was to create a mill race. According to tax records, one of the owners, Thomas Stanton, was a man of color. He seems to have been the only African, mill, African American miller owner in the county. Heishman's Mill is a familiar sight to those who travel Creek Road. This mill looks much the same today, largely because of the efforts of William Foshag, who has nurtured the mill since the 1960s and has actually owned it longer than any other single owner. We might rightfully call it Foshag's. But this mill was built by Diller in 1802 and has been known as Diller's, Kiter's, Heishman's, and Newhouser's. The mill halted operation in 1958 during the grinder period of ownership in the 1860s, an itinerant woodcarver named Wilhelm Schimmel resided at the mill from time to time. And he may have used discarded wood from the busy sawmill for his now famous carvings. This is a present day picture of the back of the mill with the tail race in the foreground. The Conda de Gwinnett flows over this way, the dam goes across here, the river flows there, the wheel was in here, it was horizontal, it was unusual construction. The dam at this mill remains intact because of the tireless efforts of Foshag, who convinced the environmental interest that the dam should be preserved because of its historical significance. The agencies involved were convinced when it became possible to install a fish bypass system on the northern side of the dam. And this was the first of its kind in the country. And it runs out a loop on the other side of the creek, uh, which we can't see here. All right, here's another county mill that may be familiar. Can anyone name it? 
Bergners. There's a lot of pictorial <coughs> representations of this mill. In 1868, Confederate raiders visited the mill and went away with a large supply of materials from the sawmill. The mill was built as a gristmill sawmill combination, in eight, but in 1822, a wool carting business was also established, as well as an oil mill, and buildings were on both sides of the creek. It was quite the uh, industrial complex. The mill was built in the 1750s by Andrew Forbes. Thomas Bergner actually had one of the shorter ownerships of the mill, which had a very long life, but again, his name is also associated with the adjoining bridge, and uh, that's why it's called Burgers. <coughs> Here's another picture of it taken from across uh, on the other side of the dam. And now, uh, when you're on the bridge, right beside the bridge, before you cross, uh, you can, on the south side, you can see the rubble and uh, traces of the mill race. After milling stopped, the building was converted into a residence, and in 1960, it was occupied by the Everett Miller family. During a cold snap in March, there was a fire, and frozen water pipes prohibited the use of water to douse the fire, and the building was consumed. And there you can see the modern bridge has replaced the covered bridge. This is a view of the site of Hayes Mill taken from the adjoining historic Iron Bridge. These bridges are, uh, have been in the, covered, in the news coverage recently. The mill site <coughs> was right here. It was erected in 1756 by William <coughs> Thompson who sold it to Conrad Jumper after 10 years. There were many other owners, including John Hayes, who owned it from 1823 to 1855. And in 1949, there was a terrible fire at this mill, too. Again, as uh, Mary Lou and David have both mentioned. This one was very well documented. Several of the mill hands were sleeping on the second floor, <coughs> and while one was able to escape, by jumping, another apprentice, Robert Lindsay, perished in the flames. He was the son of another mill owner in Mifflin Township, and he was the grandson of Isaac Schellerberger, whose mill we saw earlier. This is a roadmap drawing of the Hayes Mill. Uh, this would be uh, Meadowbrook Road and Creek Road in that area. The water from the mill race came directly, here's the mill race, came directly into the mill, exited the mill, and joined a run that came down the hill and re-entered into the common clinic. This is the last mill along the creek before it enters North Middleton Township, and uh, Rachel is going to tell us about the mills to the east of this along the common clinic. <coughs> We are going to continue our journey on to the Susquehanna by starting with Blaine's Mill in North Middleton. This was the mill of Ephraim Blaine, who was a frontier trader, uh, who decided to settle down north of Carlisle and build and manage his own mills. So he purchased a great many acres of land in the Cave Hill area, this being a drawing of the cave here, and this being his mill and house up above, and he established what he called the Cave Farm in 1772. Now, not long after this mill was built, Blaine became involved in the Revolutionary War as a quartermaster. And this brought his milling and business experience to support the American Revolution. Beer's history of Cumberland County says of Blaine, his flowering mill on the Conna de Gwinnett near Carlisle was enlarged and kept in operation to its utmost capacity for the benefit of the suffering army and without profit to himself. 
His extensive fortune was ever at the disposal of his country, and by his earnest and careful management, he kept the soldiers from actual starvation. So, a very important mill in American history. Blaine eventually left this mill to his son Robert and moved himself to a bigger milling complex in Middlesex where the Latour meets the Conondagonic Creek. Uh, this mill here stayed in the Blaine family until 1885 when they sold it to the Carlisle Gas and Water Company who used it for a pump house. This is a picture of the building just before demolition. It was torn down in 1982 and CCHS has the date stone above the door here. That's in our museum collection. We'll use that when we get to the mill exhibit. <coughs> we'll move down to Willow Mill, which was built around 1795 and now stands in Willow Mill Park. But this area started as a serious manufacturing complex. In the 1790s, it was a grist mill, a saw mill, an iron forge. Now the iron forge didn't last very long and neither did the woolen business, which owner Thomas Fisher attempted to start at that site. However, the next owner, George Bucher, was successful in adding a clover mill and plaster mill to the grist and saw mill that was operating here. So a very important site for industry, but also a site for family events, including the weddings of Mary and Clara, who were Bucher's daughters. Now, when the mill was owned by the Huston family in the late 1800s, it was destroyed by fire twice <coughs> during their ownership. They rebuilt it two times, and the current mill is uh, what you see here. So that was rebuilt around 1885 is when that dates to. When we reach the 1900s, uh, milling begins to decrease here, and the mill is owned by the DeWalt family. And this is Raymond DeWalt, who turns it from a mill into a kind of creekside retreat. Uh, this is also the family, the founding father of DeWalt Power Tools. Uh, this, he used the mill as a workshop. His line of power tools got started with the Wonder Worker radial arm saw. So, I'm a fan. <laughs> anyway. Later, uh, the amusement park is built here in the 1950s, and that lasts for a while, but now that too is gone. And we just have the park and the mill building still remaining. The park is owned by Silver Spring Township, and the Friends of Willow Mill is a group doing some fundraising who would like to restore this building for use as a community center in that area. All right. Continuing on in Silver Spring Township, we're actually going to leave the Conde de Gwinnett and go to the Trindle Spring Run, also called Silver Spring Run. We are, well, Mechanicsburg's kind of down through the floor here where the stream starts. When we get up here, this is Bricker's Mill, the one in the picture. Uh, the Carlisle Pike is right here, so this mill would have been sitting right along where it's very developed now. There's actually a business, a uh, aquatic center business that is sort of perched on top of where this mill would have been. Wegmans and that whole shopping center is over here, and the creek runs right up through here. So Brinker's Mill was a very early mill being built in the 1760s, and it was owned by another frontier trader, Robert Callender, and he once rented it out to Ephraim Blaine. But the owners I'm going to start with are the Pollock family, several of whom own this building. Oliver Pollock is probably the most notable. He's known as a financier of the American Revolution. He also gets some credit for inventing the dollar sign, too. Um, so he was not a miller. He was a mill owner and a mill manager. So he rented out the mill, which was a grist mill and a saw mill. He also had a tavern here. He rented all these properties to the same person who was named David Briggs. Now, David's daughter, Mary, married Oliver's son, Jared. And Oliver's letters show that he did not approve of his son marrying his tenant's daughter. So the two of them kind of left the area and, and headed west, and I hope they had a happy life together. <laughs> but anyway, Pollock was plagued by debt, partially uh, from his role in the American Revolution. And David Briggs brought the, bought the property outright from him at a sheriff's sale in 1800. 
Now David, in his will, divided these properties between his three sons. His oldest, David, also named David, got the first mill, which is right here, the first. His second son, Benjamin, got the tavern, which is over here-ish. And his third son, Joseph, got a piece of land with only a dam on it, up here near the creek. However, Joseph did not truly get the short end of the stick, as we'll see in our next entry. But continuing on with the story of Brickers, it gets the name Brickers because David Briggs, the son, shortly after he acquired it, sold it to the Bricker family, and this family owned it from 1813 on through most of the 1800s. Uh, they were very successful at milling. The mill was passed down in the family. Uh, but by the 1900s, again, the era of milling was over at this building. It was several different businesses uh, until 1943 when it caught fire. Uh, it burned and was eventually demolished in the 1960s. Okay, Briggs Bryson Mill. This is the powerhouse of Hampton Township right here. This building is no longer standing. This was torn down in the 2000s to make way for uh, road development when the shopping center went in. But this mill was Joseph Briggs' empty dam of 1804. If you'll remember, older brother David seemed to get the better end of the deal with the grist mill, but he lost that mill fairly quickly uh, due to his debts. So that one was sold to the Brickers, and at that point, Joseph and his empty dam was free to build. So he built. He built a sawmill, he added a grist mill, he added a plaster mill. And he's developing this big milling complex there. And so I think that's why he shares his name with the mill's next major owner, Thomas B. Bryson. Now, here is a photo of the mill. You can see it right there, sitting along the creek. Uh, the mill is gone. Some of the other buildings uh, still remain. And the road uh, runs through here to Lambs Gap Bridge. So Bryson, under him, this mill made roughly 10,000 barrels of flour per year from the 1850s through the 1870s. By the 1880s, most of his work was merchant work to be packed and sold wholesale. The production was really head and shoulders above the other mills that were in this area. He kept two employees at work here. They made from 70 cents to a dollar for a 10-hour workday. So after Bryson, the mill was rented to different owners up through the 1940s. Uh, and it lasted for quite a while after that until it was eventually removed. Also in Hampton Township, we have Good Hope Mill. Now this one's still standing. So it's one of four brick mills that are still standing in the county and was built by Jonas and Elizabeth Rupp. And Jonas was said in his biography to have a passion for building mills and bridges and roads and houses. And this is something he built in 1821. He was very proud of it. Uh, they called it the Surprise of Cumberland. And on the date stone, they listed all the different contractors, the bricklayer, the millwright, the carpenter, all the different people who helped them to build this mill. An interesting thing that was found as the mill is being renovated is this mark on the wall right here. This is by a window. And I've seen uh, similar marks referred to as ritual marks, which would be sort of a good luck charm to ward off evil influences or, or witches, if you will. This thing here that looks like a W is actually two letters B, and that's to represent the Virgin Mary. So asking for her protection, I think. Now, despite being very proud of the mill that he built, Rupp did not own it for very long. Within five years, he sold the mill. He was in debt. He lost a lot of money building all his homes, mills, bridges, and roads. So for the rest of its life, uh, the mill had several different owners through the 1800s, was operating still quite late, at least uh, 1949, and is currently privately owned. The owner hopes uh, someday to restore the surprise of Cumberland to the Conadiguinic Creek. Here's a picture of the interior. This is way up in the ceiling. You can see the peak of the roof <coughs> here. But this is the drive system for the mill. So these would have been connected by leather belts all the way down into the basement where the water wheel was uh, providing the power for this thing. 
Oysters Mill is a name that's still pretty familiar thanks to the Oyster Mill Playhouse. Uh, the Playhouse is built on the foundations of the mill. This one was a brick mill, but that is no longer in place. The Oyster name comes about in 1820 when Abraham Oyster buys the property. Now he was a tavern keeper and he wanted to stay in that business, so his brother George became the mill operator. The two brothers married sisters, Maria and Elizabeth Keysecker, and they were daughters of a nearby miller on the Cedar Spring. So he had a brick mill, and this really in the foreground of the picture was the associated sawmill. You can see what they're doing here. So the Oyster family owned the mill for over 60 years, uh, and then sold it. It went through a couple owners, and in 1902, uh, the mill was sold to a businessman out of Harrisburg. His name was Patricio Russ. The mill was in need of upgrades. He put thousands of dollars into it, but the same year that he purchased it, it burned. Mm -hmm. So he went, he rebuilt the whole thing, he made improvements to the dam, he updated it, put a new roller process in, and eventually he sold it as well. It continued milling uh, for some time. But eventually that was over and it became several different businesses before the theater purchased the foundations of the mill in 1980. Well, it was a building at that time, but in 1988 the theater converted it for their use. And finally, the Harrisburg Mail Works, which is our mill closest to the Susquehanna River on the Conondagoinet was a major business in this area. It became one of the largest factories of its kind in the United States, producing nails. It began in the 1830s, and by 1850, they were making about 30,000 kegs of nails yearly, and they employed about 125 people. Compare that to all the mills we saw before, which were operating with one or two uh, employees. The mill took the name of the Harrisburg Nail Works, in 1859, when it was purchased by James McCormick. McCormick, like the last owners, continued to build, uh, expand, and rebuild after fires. At its peak, though, the nail works had 83 nail machines and employed about 400 workers, some of whom you can see here. In 1876, they even had their own band. <laughs> Daniel Drawball, local inventor of telephone fame, patented several improvements for the nail machines, and they were designed, I think, for this factory. They were certainly used here. But cut nails, like we were producing here, did not last into the 20th century. The invention of the wire nail in the late 1800s was the beginning of the end, and the mill permanently closed in 1898. The land was eventually sold to the borough of West Fairview, where it's now a park. If you walk back, you can even see a couple of the brick arches, which still remain near the creek. Uh, also of interest, the museum about this nail mill is maintained by the Historical Society of East Pennsboro, so definitely <coughs> worth a visit there. Uh, you can talk to them. You can also go on one of our mill tours. We'll be stopping by. And so, in conclusion to our trip down the Cana de Gwinnett and also our final Wednesday in winter relating to mills, I'm going to leave you with this poem written about the Briggs Bryson Mill. Beside the shady silver spring, nearby a vine clad hill, where weeping willows gently sway, there stands an ancient mill. Built half of wood and half of stone, 200 years it held its own. But now the wheels no longer turn, all silent there they sit, and swallows in the gloom of night fly darkly through the pit. The night wind sadly whispers in the weeping willow trees, the water softly murmurs by the shore. But the mill that stood 200 years will grind again no more. And so if there are any questions, uh, we'll be happy to try and answer them. And if not, thank you for coming. It seems as though many of these mills, if not all of them, have had their floor mills inside. What fraction of them had exterior wheels as opposed to in the basement or inside the building? I'm not sure. It does seem like most of them were interior. I think part of it had to do with when the technology changed. Dan Drawbone's here. He's our 
engineering expert. Do you have an answer for that? Dan? Well, many of the wheels were indoors, the vertical wheels, to protect them from the weather, because the weather would do a lot of damage uh, with ice and snow on them. And in the mid-1800s, many of the vertical wheels were converted to turbines, which were all mounted inside in the basement of the mills. <laughs> Then many of them were the grist mills were converted to turbines. <laughs>